Here we're going to take a look at proteins, and I'm going to try to give you an overview of proteins. When you look at the entire biology syllabus or anything that you would study over two years in biology, proteins will pretty much touch every single topic. And so if you don't have a good grasp of what a protein is, what it's made up of, uh, what proteins can actually do, then it becomes very difficult. You have to be able to try to picture a protein kind of at, in a three-dimensional model as well too. So this next slide will attempt to give an overview of everything that proteins are all about. So key thing here is that proteins are pretty much everything that does anything inside a cell. So there's a couple different examples here. Now, if you're just seeing this for the first time, each of these types of proteins, these general names or specific names for proteins, it's going to look really overwhelming. So just keep in mind that as you go through more material in the syllabus, that you'll start to get a kind of global picture of how important proteins are for biological functioning. So you have uh, enzymes, for example, that are important in photosynthesis or pretty much every metabolic process, cellular respiration. Another key thing to know is that lots of genetic diseases that cause problems in our in our bodies are often because of some kind of malfunction of a protein which was coded for incorrectly inside the dna so insulin is a hormone you know that controls uh, blood sugar levels you're going to see that when we talk about homeostasis in antibodies uh, antibodies are actually proteins as well too the fancy name for them is immunoglobins so of course you're going to see that when we turn to learn about defense against disease uh, rhodopsin is a specific type of protein which happens to be a pigment a pigment protein which helps us to be able to see collagen is more of a structural protein it's probably the most common uh, structural protein that's found in the body and it's in your bones your muscles skin etc as well too a lot of beauty products uh, contain the claim to contain a lot of collagen to help boost your collagen connections not not so sure how well that works and of course if you're spider-man then you produce spider silk but spider-man is a fiction so only spiders produce spider silk but there's lots of technologies that are trying to use spider silk or learning from the structure found in spider silk so I guess that's also a protein so you may know already that proteins are kind of like big lego building structures that are actually made up of smaller units and those smaller units are called amino acids and this is the general structure for an amino acid there's usually a consistent uh, ncc in the middle and this is the amino side and this is the acid side remember that acids are very cool and so this reminds me it's amino acid this r group can be one of like 20 different uh, possible subgroups and you're going to see why that's important in a second here okay if connecting this to the cells unit, you should know that uh, proteins are made by ribosomes. And if here's a general cell, this is plant cell over here, this is animal cell, just organized into one nice, nice little diagram. These little dots here are the things that are called ribosomes, and they are where these proteins are actually produced. They're produced by using instructions, now connecting to genetics, they're used by they're made by using instructions that are encoded for in the DNA, which is found inside the, the nucleus as well, too. Okay, amino acids. Uh, I mentioned 20 different R groups. So it turns out it's those R groups that make them the different types. So 20 different types of amino acids with differing R groups. So if you wanted to represent them with different colors, I don't know if there's 20 circles here, but there's a whole bunch of different amino acids that exist. Okay, we've established that proteins are made up of amino acids, and there are many different types of amino acids. These amino acids, can you follow my red arrow here, can be rearranged in different ways to form chains of amino acids called polypeptides. Polypeptides, if you connect two amino acids together, the bond in between the two amino acids is called a peptide Bond. So polypeptide just means numerous peptide bonds connecting a bunch of amino acids together. So chains of amino acids are called polypeptides. And these polypeptides can be proteins. If you have one polypeptide, say like this little colorful bad boy right here, that could be a protein. But some proteins are made up of one or more polypeptides that are connected together. An example would be hemoglobin so hemoglobin found in your red blood cells is actually made up of four polypeptide chains that are kind of combined together to create some kind of functional unit that carries oxygen around okay 
If you haven't learned about genetics yet, then just bear with me for a little bit. The order of which amino acid goes in which position, so first amino acid, second amino acid, third amino acid, so on and so forth, how do we know or how does the body know what order to put them in in order to make the polypeptide or protein that does its specific job? Because each one of these proteins right here is actually just made up of amino acids that are sequenced in a specific order, which is actually determined by your genes. So you're going to see all of this connecting together. And when you look at your genes, genes are actually just DNA. So DNA has four different letters, A's, T's, C's, and G's. And the order of those letters spells out the gene. And you can see that I've tagged them here in every three letters. And this is actually how it works. Every three letters codes for a specific amino acid. So this is a universal code. So in any living organism that we know of out there, they use the same code. So if someone tells it TAC, that will actually cause the cell to just recruit this specific, I don't know, red amino acid, let's say. In my body, TAC also codes for that same amino acid, and it's pretty much the same across all living organisms. This is spectacular. So you can see how genetic mutations where one letter gets messed up can actually cause the wrong amino acid to go into place, and that can totally mess up the sequence, which can then mess up how the protein actually works. Um, one next step to go is, so what? Okay, now I get this actual chain. What does that do? It turns out this chain of amino acids can fold into very specific shapes. So I've drawn over my little point here, but what I'm trying to say is the sequence here, which is determined by the genes, actually will determine the three-dimensional structure of how this protein is actually going to fold. Uh, this is getting to some higher level detail, but it's just important to know that these proteins all have specific shapes. So if they start folding like this, now why do they fold in a specific way? It's because between these amino acids, the R groups kind of interact in different ways. If some of the R groups like water, for example, they might tend to group together, and so the R groups will attract each other. If some of them are positively charged, they might push away other positively charged ones. So overall, I mean, this is just one turn, one bend, but if you had actually had a three-dimensional structure, there might be very specific turns that look like this, and then sections that look like this, that fold back over here, and fold back over here, kind of like a slap bracelet. I don't know. Do you guys know what a slap bracelet is? I used to have those when I was a kid. They were really cool. They made me cool. But when you have a slap bracelet, the point is uh, it's a flat band, but when you flick it, it all of a sudden rolls up into this exact same shape every single time. That's kind of like what a protein is. It has an exact three-dimensional shape, and the sequence will always make it fold the exact same way, and its three-dimensional shape is so important. Hope you're still with me right now, but uh, I've, you've heard of enzymes, right? So Rubisco is an enzyme. You've probably heard of amylase. I'm running out of space here. Let's find a blank sheet here. If this is an enzyme, you all know that something called a substrate can bind to the active site here, and then this thing can get like broken down into two smaller chunks. Why, how does this know that, how does this always attach to here and other molecules not attach there? Well, it's because when we draw this silly shape of an enzyme right here, it's actually a three-dimensional structure that has a very specific shape and we can like rotate it around and like take a look at it. This molecule, this substrate will only bind in a specific part of that particular thing. Okay, so back to this almost, oh, I guess that's it. That's what I was trying to say is all of these things add up together what a protein is, what the amino acids are, their actual uh, functions, the sequence is important. But this is pretty much, if you understand all of this, uh, you will be in a much better place when it comes to understanding uh, why protein shapes are so important from specific antibodies recognizing uh, viral particles to enzymes recognizing specific molecules to protein channels in the cell membrane that only let certain things through. Everything is about specific shape.